Well, Africa being credited with another contribution to science. CNN's Patricia Kelly talked with researchers who have evidence that 20,000 years ago, before the pharaohs of Egypt, another African civilization produced a sophisticated calculator. Proof that primitive man was well acquainted with mathematics lies under lock and key in the dusty archives on the 19th floor of Belgium's Royal Institute of Natural Science. Best described as a prehistoric calculator, it's a piece of animal bone just 10 centimeters long, about 4 inches. Discovered in the 1950s by a leading Belgian archaeologist, the bone was found near Lake Edward at Ishango, on the border between the Congo and Rwanda. What sets the bone apart from the other fossils and fragments found at Ishango are its markings, groups of notches arranged in three distinct columns. They are very, very well organized. They are not made at random. If, the, if you, you can make notches at random just to count how many animals you have uh, killed today or something like that, but it's rather well organized. When the notches are counted, a series of number sequences emerges. They suggest a number system based on 10, another based on 12, as well as a knowledge of multiplication and of prime numbers. This is a replica of the bone. It's thought this piece of quartz at the tip may have been used for writing or engraving. The Ashango bone may also be proof that a highly advanced civilization existed in Central Africa 15,000 years before the emergence of Egyptian culture. Homo sapiens may therefore have evolved in Central Africa before anywhere else in the world. We have more and more proofs of mathematical activities in Africa, not written, but on stones, on bones, on strings. So indeed, there are more reasons to think that it's the start of, it's the very first mathematical activity. And to my, in, well, in my view, of course, it's even, it should not be on the 19th floor. It should be on a golden table at the entrance of the museum. It's thought Ishango man's numbers system may have spread north following the River Nile into Egypt as well as into West Africa. Now his influence may travel even further. This award-winning film director wants to take the bone into space and make a documentary about it. I want to make a link uh, uh, between the history, the, first, uh, the history of Africa and the future of the mankind. With the help of the European Space Agency, he's already taken the bone on a practice parabolic flight in zero gravity. The project is a deliberate allusion to the opening scenes from Stanley Kubrick's classic science fiction film 2001, A Space Odyssey. Fifty years after the Ashango bone was found and stuffed away in a drawer, it could be blasted into outer space, turning science fiction into fact. That could happen even before it goes on public display here on Earth. Patricia Kelly, CNN, Brussels. And um, recently I've worked with a number of other people on, a, on a, an intriguing specimen from Nigeria that's only 13,000 years old from a site called Iwo Eleru. This is the oldest fossil human in the whole of West Africa. It's only 13,000 years old. And in my PhD, it came out as a rather strange mixture of archaic and modern human features. And I thought that was maybe just uh, the way I'd studied it or measured it or analyzed it at that time in 1974. So I revisited the specimen with new dating work and in collaboration with people like Katerina Havati, geometric morphometrics. And uh, in the session at the AAPA meetings, um, we presented the idea that this specimen actually was very distinct from, uh, from recent populations in West Africa and indeed showed some rather archaic features. Here it is compared with the Yunga Loba specimen from Lightly, which is uh, dated usually around 150,000 years old. In Katerina's geometric morphometric analyses, this was the nearest neighbor in terms of cranial shape to Iwo Eleru. And in the same session in which we presented our results at the Fizanth meetings, Is Isabel Krevka presented uh, with co-authors, including Alison Brooks, the view that at Ishango in the Congo, similarly in a late Stone Age context, there were specimens from Ishango that showed archaic characteristics less than 20,000 years ago. So a more complex picture here uh, for Africa than we normally think of.
culture, you find exactly the same uh, motifs repeated in the very sophisticated Egyptian art form. The Egyptian god Anubis has become one of the most recognizable symbols of ancient Egypt. This is Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of embalming and the guardian of the dead. And his likeness was actually used by the ancient Egyptians in mask form, in the form we see in front of us, um, during the very sacred rituals of the funeral. In funerary rites, uh, one of the priests would wear this exact same mask and perform the magical rituals which would enable the dead to live again in the afterlife. And I find it really fascinating that in the Saharan cultures we're finding petroglyphs of, of human beings wearing jackal masks, uh, almost dog-headed figures in fact, uh, at least a thousand years prior to the emergence of Anubis in ancient Egyptian mythology. So the rise of the cattle cult and animal-headed humans in central Saharan society occurred well before their appearance in the Nile Valley. But could a small, obscure society really have this much influence? The archaeologists had to know whether the culture of Juan Mahujaj had spread beyond the southwestern corner of Libya. 500 miles to the south, a site in modern-day Niger began to provide the answers to this question. In the 1980s, French archaeologists uncovered pottery, human burials, and rock art, which were all almost exactly the same as the evidence found in Libya by the Italians. And similar artifacts were found throughout North Africa. It looked like this culture was far more widespread than anyone had ever imagined. So I have just here Tripoli. We have here Cairo and, and the Nile, and just in the center we have the Akakos Mountains. And we have uh, Algeria, uh, Libya, Egypt, and Sudan, and Chad, and Niger, and, and Mali. So this area is bigger than Europe, so it means that all this very, very large extent was inhabited during ancient times uh, by the same ancient African Saharan culture. The size of this culture was extraordinary. It spanned most of North Africa, from Mali to the western fringes of Egypt itself. And nearby, some astonishing discoveries have revealed further evidence of craft. They may force experts to rewrite the history of West Africa's development. At a place called Onjugu, the past hasn't been dug up by archaeologists. It's been revealed by nature. It's hard to believe, but within living memory, it's impossible to stand where I'm standing now. 
The water levels of these two rivers used to be much, much higher. But after a huge storm, the rivers broke their banks. They changed course. And what they revealed in the mud has changed archaeology. The river erosion created an archaeologist's dream, a cross-section of history in layers of sediment. In 2002, an international team began finding evidence of prehistoric human activity. Adamo Dembele is from Mali's cultural mission, which works to preserve the country's archaeological heritage. Nous sommes sur un des sites où l'équipe a eu à travailler avec une grande équipe. On a commencé de là-haut jusqu'en bas pour faire un décapage. Au cours de ça, nous avons fait la découverte et la lecture des différentes couches qui ont été déposées. Effectivement, nous avons trouvé des, des tessons de, de céramique. Et effectivement, il y a toujours une différence des, des périodes, des époques qui mettent la différence entre les céramiques trouvées. The archaeologists carbon dated the pottery fragments to 11,400 years ago. People were using pottery here 8,000 years before it appeared in Britain. The fragments are 2,000 years older than any other pottery found in Africa. They're the same age as the oldest known pottery in the world. That fairly modest piece of ceramic tells a revolutionary story. I mean, this is a material that must have transformed the lives of the people here. It allowed people to transport things, to store things. I mean, this really is revolutionary. The discovery of such ancient pottery here means that West Africa was way ahead of its time, when West Africans began developing the skills that would eventually create some of the most exquisite art in the world, Europe was just emerging from the last ice age. The British recognized the extraordinary quality of the Benin bronzes when they took them in 1897, but they thought that Africans were incapable of creating them. It's only recently that the full and extraordinary history of West African craftsmanship has begun to emerge. Now we can see how the bronzes give us an insight, not just into the Kingdom of Benin, but into a wider history. With fluctuating senses of power, cultural identity in West Africa was more important than a sense of nationhood. The bronzes show us the power of the Oba and the spirits that protected him and his people and they're the culmination of important indigenous developments over thousands of years throughout this part of the continent. The kingdoms of West Africa share many important aspects, pottery, ironwork, but also a history of telling their story through art. These things were, and always will be, truly African. <laughs>